Hey, so we are back here for the first session with Kavi Gupta. As everybody's hearing me, I think everything is good. So our first uh, speaker is Kavi Gupta, and he is a writer and contributor for Forbes. Um, he's been writing a lot of different essays about remote work and technology. So he's acquired a lot of knowledge from different companies and individuals who's been talking about remote work and the future of work. So it's going to be very interesting to hear his thoughts about how to survive in the 21st, how to survive work in the 21st century. So I'm very excited to um, bring Kavi to the screen. I'm just going to go ahead and bring him to the screen. Hello, Kevin. Hi. Hey. Hi. Hi, Dan. How Good. are you? Good. Thank you. And before we start, I just wanted to remind people that if they have any questions, they can ask them directly below in the Q&A section while Kevin will be speaking. And then the last 10 minutes, we will answer all of your questions. So um, I'm going to go ahead and hide myself. So the stage is yours, and I'm going to put your slide up, and I wish you a good session. Awesome. Thank you, Daphne. And Daphne, just double check before we jump in, because yeah. I am the first session. You can see my title slide. I'll just put your slide up and I can see your slide right now. Yes. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you, Daphne. Oh. Thank you, Anna. Thank you everyone at Human Made for having me here today. Um, this is the first time I've done a virtual conference, so that's pretty cool. Um, I'm going to talk to you about how to survive work in the 21st century. And I know a lot of the people who are in the audience today are maybe um, have had some experience as remote workers or distributed workers or have had some experience in using the tech advantage of today to secure more meaningful and maybe even better paying and challenging work. Um, and I imagine some of you might be new to it, or maybe some of you are thinking about taking on um, this type of work or this type of lifestyle. And over the past three or four years, I've been kind of studying it and living it. And so I've kind of collected what I believe are some of the core skills um, to survive work in this century and to remain competitive. And the reason why I want to do that is because I'm on a personal mission to change the way how people think about work. And um, it all started mostly when I was really young. My parents made me think about what I was going to be from a very early age. And in fairness to them, they would have liked me to get a good job, you know, to be a doctor, to be a bank, to be a banker, or to be a lawyer. They wanted the best money, and these jobs were what they considered to be the best for the security of my future. But none of those jobs sounded interesting to me. Um, in fact, I knew that I wanted to be a writer. Now, that kind of scared my parents off fairly quickly because as far as they knew, writers didn't make much money. So my choice to pursue the work I enjoyed doing resulted in a lot of tension between me and my parents. And they meant well in trying to steer me towards secure work, but they failed to ask me what I was good at and how I could harness those skills into proper paying work. Um, I am lucky to say that through practice, patience, and a lot of perseverance, I've been able to monetize my skills into good paying work. Um, that's not the reality for many people today, and so that's what I want to change, and that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. For me, um, it starts with the fundamental belief that jobs will always come and go, but we also have to be mindful of the circumstances that exist today that might not have existed before. For instance, you know, by the time a lot of people get out of high school, um, the jobs that they were kind of studying for or hoping to go towards might not exist anymore. Um, there's the obvious famous kind of onset of automation that's going to displace a number of low skilled or high manual labor jobs. Uh, there's the argument for a basic income where anyone can earn a foundational stipend every month um, and that could free people up to pursue the work that they really want to do um, and the work that really makes them happy. We don't know how any of this is going to play out but we are certain that the right skills will be the currency of success in the future job market. It's how you're gonna stay competitive, it's how you're gonna stay relevant. But to understand that, I think one of the things that we have to get better at, and this is what I spend a lot of time trying to figure out, is finding what work people should be doing. And the work that people should be doing is a combination of understanding um, what people are good at, uh, what they like doing, um, how it could be useful to a company, or how it could be useful to the marketplace, um, especially if you can monetize it to the marketplace. The sweet spot in the middle is what I tell a lot of people when I speak to them, no matter what generation you're from, whether you're going from high school into university or high school into work, or you're kind of a veteran of the job market or you're looking to change careers, the sweet spot in the middle is what any generation should aim to achieve. And ultimately, everyone should have the ability to do meaningful work um, that they enjoy. 
So I just want to kind of point out before I jump into the skills that I'm not here to talk trash. Um, I believe that it's important to acknowledge how far we've come as workers, as business owners, as teachers, counselors, and engaged parents or students. And it would be easy for me to say that practices from the past are outdated and useless, but that's not fair. Um, that's why I'm using my skills as a writer, my access to an audience, and my network to update and adjust what exists today. You're going to see that we're not necessarily reinventing the wheel here because we're going to take what works already from a lot of great big companies, a lot of great small companies and startups, and we're going to make it work even better if we find the right match of um, skills and expertise to make that happen. More importantly, it's important that we update what works to our current needs. So I'm going to start with what I call my Holy Trinity model. I believe that these three skills are the bedrock to everything, especially if you are a keen remote worker. I would say that organization, uh, process, and communication is, is key to becoming a great worker. If you want to succeed in any employment endeavor uh, or entrepreneurial adventure, you have to master these three skills. And I've borrowed much of this from high school assignment rubrics. Uh, you know, the, the kind of piece of paper that would grade how well you did on an essay or how well you did on an assignment. But instead of assessing them, uh, assessing someone on how you perform on an essay, uh, we should instead, instead assess them on how they perform on activities geared toward career and enterprise training. So I'll show you some examples from the real world. Um, I used to publish a regular column called What Do You Do? And the segment highlighted unique jobs and the people behind them especially the skills that were required to do those jobs well. And in my interviews, I frequently hear my subjects mention the Holy Trinity as a foundation to that success. This is my friend, Kristen. Uh, she works for the Canadian Space Agency, and she trains astronauts on how to perform science experiments on board the International Space, Space Station. Now, Kristen is highly educated with a degree in engineering, but without the three points of my Holy Trinity, or what I'm calling my Holy, Holy Trinity, the organization, the process, and the communication, she would not be suitable for the job that she does today. She needs all three of those skills to make sure that her um, colleagues, who are essentially astronauts, survive and can, conform, can perform the work that they need to do. So not all of us are gonna help astronauts, but we might wanna do other things. There's my friend Ben. He composes music for film and television, and he told me that writing music is the easy part. What he had to truly master was the organization and communication skills, you know, selling his skills to directors uh, and producers, ensuring that the deadlines were met, making sure he got paid. You know, Ben is essentially running his own business, so a basic understanding of accounting is crucial to his work. Then there's Maddie Madison. He is a popular chef and online personality. He hosts Dead Set on Life. It's a travel show for a travel and food show for Vice. Um, in our conversation, he pointed out that prepping and cooking are actually the easy parts of what he has to do. You can do that fairly well with enough practice in any kitchen. Um, what he truly had to develop was communication skills. If he couldn't communicate to his team, then you know the whole kitchen was in danger of collapsing. There's also my friend Tiffany. Now, Tiffany is a merchandiser for a large North American fashion brand. Tiffany knew that she wanted to be in fashion, but didn't think uh, being a designer or model would be sustainable. Instead, she looked at work in the bigger ecosystem of fashion and, and realized that she could become a merchandiser, which is a job where you organize and market each season's product to her customers. So beyond being able to identify great clothing to wear and, and having a sense of style, she had to develop process and communication skills in order to collaborate with the entire retail supply chain that exists in the background of the fashion world. Lastly, there is my friend Megan, and she tutors underprivileged, underprivileged students on technology skills development. And Megan is a pretty lively and enthusiastic communicator, but her organization and process skills were holding her back from doing the job well. So Megan recognized how important those skills were to the success of her uh, job as a teacher. Um, and she continues to research creative techniques that she can apply every day. So, okay, I've shown you some examples of the Holy Trinity at work, but how can this model be applied to others? How can you use it um, to obtain great work? How can you use it to sell yourself to uh, companies that would be hiring remotely or looking for your challenge, uh, for, for your skill sets? And if you run a company, how do you look for these types of things in an interview process? So what I envision here is a spectrum that can measure a person's ability to be organized, to manage a, uh, or implement a process, uh, and to communicate effectively. 
the first thing I always ask is how organized are you? Are you someone who stays on top of to do's or are you someone that has to kind of always chase your to do list? The same can be asked for process. How well do you implement and execute an idea? And lastly, communication. How well do you communicate your idea and its implementation to others? So what can we do with this information? Well, it presents a unique opportunity for mentorship. What if we could pair people or workers or create um, hiring modules where we can actually assess the impact of organization process and communication within any hiring situation or in any performance review situation? If you're already working in this world, this kind of skills assessment can help you analyze where you are strongest and where you need to do a bit of work. So you may say that you're not as organized, but you can work on that if you ask yourself the right questions and put the right mechanisms in place. The same way with process. If you're high on process or very high up on the, on the skills, uh, sorry, the tally for process, you in a way can be a mentor for others within organizations to say, here's how I use process to do great work um, and maybe it can help you as well. So now that we have our foundation, I'm gonna jump into the actual skills. The first one that I talk about a lot is the entrepreneurial mindset. Um, I think this is crucial because uh, the business world is full of inspiration, but what's happening here is that being entrepreneurial doesn't mean just starting your own business. It's also having a mindset. It means thinking like a business owner and it encourages a few crucial traits. You have to have a willingness to fail. You have to have the ability to experiment. You need to think creatively about problem solving. And I think you need to exist as a free agent in a world where long-term permanent employment is on the decline. So some of you today in the audience might be full on entrepreneurs. Some of you might just have an entrepreneurial mindset, but these are kind of the four areas where I believe as a first skill is crucial to kind of success of a worker in, in, this, in this modern century. A lot of you in the crowd today have technical ability and that may seem obvious in the digital age, but the real challenge is matching an individual's technical skill set to the needs of the marketplace. Students may exhibit uh, strong abilities with social media, web development or software, but how capable are they at flexing those skills for a company or client in the job market? You don't have to be a technology expert entirely. I know some of you are probably fantastic developers, uh, designers, uh, and systems administrators, network administrators, what have you. But for the rest of us, you know, you do have to have an understanding of the impact that technology continues to have um, on the workplace and in employment. This one I know is really gonna hit home with everyone here at the event today, but virtual and remote work options are increasingly becoming the norm for companies. Um, it's cheaper for companies. It allows teams to attract talent from anywhere in the world, and it offers individuals the flexibility to work however and wherever they want. Um, that could be a tough adjustment for some people who, you know, might be used to more rigid structures because they've learned in school or in corporate offices to go to work. Um, but people who can become increasingly mobile and use that advantage to be productive will certainly stand out. You know, your, your mobility is going to dictate the quality of work and compensation. Uh, there are countries who are hungry for your skills and that opens the possibility of getting hired maybe without even leaving your hometown. I think the ability to be multilingual is so important and maybe you picked up an extra language in school, but um, being able to use that language frequently, many of you might be bilingual, trilingual, quadrilingual, whatever. It's an amazing asset to have in the future job market, um, it, primarily because the emerging market is so hungry for talent and people who can speak different languages. Um, it might also help to think about some of the languages that you may speak and how um, that language might allow you to earn more um, or to find more challenging work. So now I'm gonna talk about portfolio careers. Here in Australia, portfolio careers have been a big thing. A lot of young people are, are, are upset about the idea that they're gonna to have to reinvent themselves. So when I say a portfolio career, I don't necessarily mean working one job and driving an Uber or waiting tables at night. I'm talking about constant reinvention, reinvention where your skills can match the changing forces in the job market. Um, so I'll just show you kind of quickly what I've been in my 12 years of working. The many different jobs that I've had as a writer. Some of these jobs didn't even exist when I was in high school and when I started working, but I knew that my skills as a writer, a communicator and content creator could help me blend into the market and to also adjust as the market changed. So whether you're working now or you've just started work, um, you'll face the same, the same task of understanding how those skills can be transferred to new jobs um, as they appear. 
I also want to stress the point that there's going to be an element of having to invent your own job. If you look at some of the stuff here, copywriter, that's existed for you know quite a while. Content producer, that's only really come about in the past 10 years. Community organizer, you know, we see a lot of that in the offline world, but now it's also becoming an online world where, where um, if you can manage an event like this, someone like Daphne uh, running this human made event is a community organizer. She's got over 1200 people sitting here listening to me talk right now. Brand strategist, that's something that didn't really exist. Journalist has always existed for a long time. Uh, now I'm playing around with a new one as I'm changing tack again to call myself a workforce thinker. I don't really like it, but we'll see how it goes. So the skills that I've mentioned here are just the beginning. We could go on and on and on about the different types of soft and hard skills that you will need to navigate to master employment decisions in your future. And I think that's where I want your help because I'm on a mission to build the career learning center of the 21st century. And it's a place where uh, people from any walk of life can build the skills to navigate the frequently changing world of work. And it means turning, turning career planning upside down, quite frankly. Um, and to do that, you know, I'm kind of traveling the world, I'm speaking in events, and I'm researching in order to find companies, uh, find schools, to find institutions and organizations to find out what's working, what's not, what could be better. My goal is to develop and test exercises to create course content and other solutions that can help everyone build the, the, the kind of key skills they need to find meaningful, well-paying paying work. And more importantly, I want to bring an end to the exhausting and frustrating conversations that take place when a person is tasked with answering the question, what do you want to be? So if you are interested in helping me, shoot me an email um, or find me on Twitter. I'm happy to meet with you in person or over the phone to discuss what we can accomplish together. Granted, if I am in your town, I am in Europe uh, in June and July. So if you're around, let's hang out. Thank you. Hey. I'm just going to put back Gabby on there. <laughs> nice. Hi. Thank you so much, Gabby. It was amazing. Thank you very much for sharing your thoughts. No worries. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I think people have been really liking it as well. I think it's very valuable for people who are starting also and they want to know a bit better how they can really assess their skills for remote work. So it was really interesting. People are reacting right now, so you can see the chat. <laughs> Thank you, Kevin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, we're having a good time now um, for a Q&A. Uh, we actually have a, a bit of a longer period, so it's good. We have some good questions down here. So I'm going to start asking you some questions. So I'm going to yeah. start answering a question from Chris. So here is, I work remotely, but most of my colleagues are office-based. Uh, how can I overcome the perception that I'm not working as hard as them, especially when it couldn't be more wrong? I think he's- Absolutely. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. And who was it that answered that, asked that question? Uh, it's uh, Chris. Chris, thank you, Chris. Chris. So, Knight. so um, that's a, it's a, it's a really good question. It's an important one because the concept of remote work is very different from location dependent work. When you go into an office in, in, in office based work, you know, we've always had visibility as the core metric of, um, you know, someone's ability to work hard and to work well, where, you know, if you stay longer hours, you've been at the office after, you know, seven o'clock or you show up at the office at 7 a.m., leave at 7 p.m., you know, that visibility is how people say, oh, man, Daphne, you work hard. You're really there all the time. Remote work isn't like that because people can't see you. People can't tangibly tell when you, when you check in, where you're coming from. And that's why deliverability is so important. How much you get done, how much you actually produce in a week. What do you ship um, every single week? What Trello cards do you move over from doing to done? And what kind of progress are you making on an actual task? That's how you measure up against your office-based workers because when you're face to face with someone, you interact and you see what they're doing all the time. Uh, as in a remote work situation, no one, no one can see what I'm doing, but mm -hmm. they can see that every week I've got four or five of my main core tasks in and we're progressing the project forward. So deliverability is key. I know that all the, the developers here probably are, yep, saying like, yep, ship, yeah. <laughs> ship, <laughs> ship, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a good one. It's true. I clearly agree with that. Um, I have another question now from Anna. So, um, how can you promote yourself as a digital nomad or a remote worker? How can you promote yourself as a digital nomad or a remote worker? I, guess I don't know how to, 
promote yourself yeah. and you'll get, I guess, finding more jobs, being more visible um, to be yeah. able to get work, I guess. Um, so do a lot of work, <laughs> do stuff, make projects. You know, one of the things I've found to be super useful for me is I constantly reach out to people and I collaborate with them. Daphne, you and I met in Chiang Mai in yeah. February. Yeah. And remember we were sitting in the back of a, of a tuk-tuk bus or whatever, getting yeah. from the event to the bar. And we just started talking and I said, hey, you know, I like what you guys are doing. Let me tell you about what I'm doing. Let's work on some stuff together. Yeah. That's how you start promoting it. Now, you have to find the balance of what's paid work and what's unpaid work. I believe everybody should get paid for the work they do, but I also believe that a certain level of hard work is required where you sometimes have to build up, um, you know, a portfolio of work. So, you know, me doing events like this or me working on, on, on eBooks or other types of writing projects with other people is a way for me to say, hey, I built this and I did it with someone across the world who I never met um, and this is what we achieved with it. And this is what I can bring to your company. I'll give you a very specific example. One being this one, we spoke in February and we met and now we're here uh, a few months later. Uh, two years ago, I wrote a book called uh, Disruption in the Developing World with a woman named Anjali Ramachandran and she's based out of the UK. We've never met. She writes, she writes a great newsletter called Other Valleys where she highlights um, unique startups from places that aren't Silicon Valley, so mostly in the developing world. We collected all these different um, companies and we made a little ebook. We said, for this year, here are all the great kind of com companies out of Africa, China, Uzbekistan, you know, all these random places that are changing infrastructure uh, and developing that part of the world. We gave the book away for free. We said, just give us a donation if you think it's worth it. Um, and, you know, we'll do, we'll just go with that. The book ended up actually raising enough money to build three schools in Nepal after the earthquake in 2014, I think it was, no, 2015. Just that in itself, you know, we volunteered our time, we put it together, we actually made money off of it, gave the money away. When I got my first kind of uh, full-time remote job where I wasn't freelance, that book was how I promoted myself. I said, look, I'm able to collaborate, I'm able to work on long projects, uh, and I'm able to actually, you know, monetize it fairly quickly in an experimental way. If you believe that I'm valuable with that asset to your company, then hire me. And that's kind of how I did it. So that's been my foundation always. Build something, show it, you know, get feedback, see how you can monetize it. Cool. Very good. I think very good feedback for this. Um, another question, um, this one is from Noel, and it's what's the biggest misconception people have when first seeking remote work? Ah, uh, that's going to be easy, that it's going to be, you know, I can work from home, I set my own hours, I can wear whatever I want, um, you know. They forget that office culture has created um, discipline, and that discipline has been so important to the way that we get work done. And I think that's why in my talk I say, I don't want to talk trash about the big companies, I don't want to talk about, I don't want to, you know, poo-poo what a lot of the big corporations have done, we got to where we are here today because of some good stuff and some bad stuff. The difference is that now we, as people, as employees, are more capable of kind of changing that, the misconceptions and improving it. So, you know, when you have been taught your whole life from school to corporate, um, that you have to be here at a time, you have to be here all day, this is how you work, and then you go home, we're so used to that. Now, imagine the next day you're like, hey, you can do whatever you want. You can set your day. A lot of people would say, um, I don't know what to do. And that is the one biggest misconception. You need to have discipline. So you need to have in that kind of triangle, you need to have organization, process, communication. That is discipline right there. You can master that, then you're going to be a fantastic remote worker. Hmm. I guess you get, you, get used to, you get used to it as well. I'm sure that when you started, maybe you were not as disciplined, but then at the beginning, you're kind of no. trying to make it work. But then with time, you kind of make yourself your own, your own routine and then you're able to. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. That's exactly what I do. I mean, to this day, I'm still trying to tweak that routine, right? It doesn't yeah. kind of go away. <laughs> in the productivity loop. I'm trying to be productive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I have another question um, yeah, from um, uh, Jean. We have um, how to go, I'm just going to select, select the string. How to, go, um, how to go about skills development in a small company? Should one focus on general skills, basic intermediate level, or go deep, uh, deep on one specific field in a mm, small company? Good question. Good question. I'm going to refer back to um, the slide I had in my presentation where I had the kind of four circles 
and it made one big Venn diagram and it talked about what you're good at, what you like doing, what's going to be useful to the company and what's going to be useful to the marketplace. Um, by doing that assessment and saying, okay, I'm good at these things and I like doing these things, this is very useful to the company because it's going to bring more customers, it's going to bring uh, happier customers, things like that. You know, that's how you can kind of triangulate what you should be focusing on. And then I think someone just right here in the comments said, be T-shaped. I'm a huge, mm. huge, huge, huge advocate of T-shaped thinking where you have this concept of understanding, but then you can go really deep into, into a specific area. So in my example, I'm a writer. I focus deeply on communication. That's all I focus on. My kind of on the surface stuff is that, yeah, I have some coding skills. I have some design skills. I can communicate to, to developers and designers and, and other kind of roles what I'm looking for because my core skill is to be a, a communicator. So when you decide, you know, what you're going to, I'm not sure if this person is a manager or is trying to find a way to kind of bring development into the company. Ask people what they're good at. Ask people what they like doing. Find out how that can be effective for the company. How does that make money for the company? Because that is important still, right? You can't work for a company if it's not making money. They can't pay you. Um, but if you can find a way to take what you're good at and what you like doing and, and find a way to turn it into a product for the company, um, you know, all the, all the more for it. And I think that's where you can really focus a lot of the um, skills development or, or personal professional development that goes on. Mm, yeah, that's really cool. Um, I mean, from my personal experience about that is interesting because, um, you know, you can, when you start working remotely, you try to be able to find work. So you try to be a good a bit of everything. And then yeah. you find yourself being very generalist and then not having a very specific uh, thing. So when I started, I was really much doing that. And I, really doing this specific thing is really helpful. Totally agree oh, with that. Um, other question would be from Andre. It's, um, what do you think about request, request IBM to remote staff to return to office? So basically IBM uh, asked the remote staff to stop working remotely and work in office. Right. And this happened as well with Yahoo when Marissa Mayer took over the CEO job. So here's my opinion. And a lot of people aren't going to like it. Uh, I don't believe that, you know, anybody deserves remote work. I don't believe that just because you're a young generation worker and you've got the flashy skills that you deserve remote work. You have to earn remote work. And what these companies are doing is that they're not taking away the um, future availability of flexible work. They're trying to reassess what their workforce is doing because they don't trust the workforce enough. So they've got, you know, thousands of employees that they don't know how to measure. They don't know how to actually say, are we doing good work if we put them in a remote environment or if we put them in the office? And the only way to kind of reconfigure that is to start from zero again, bring everybody back and put into place a pilot program that can then slowly experiment again, you know, okay, Let's take a cohort of people and make them work remotely. What is success? What's failure? How do people work their way up into remote work um, so that they can enjoy that, that kind of um, that flexibility? And that was the same thing with Yahoo, with Marissa Mayer. You know, everybody gave her a lot of crap and said, oh, you're taking away this kind of uh, this perk. And it's like, no, you, you know, what she was doing was trying to understand where's the problem in this company. And if part of that is that people are at home not doing work, then we need to fix that. And that's the same thing with IBM. Companies are still going to exist where they say, you know, part of the workforce has to be in an office. That's just going to be the case. But what's going to change is that more employees are going to be given the, uh, the option to pick remote work or other types of flexible work. Granted, they can earn it and granted that they can, that it creates value for the company. I work for a company that is 26 people across nine time zones. We have to earn that. And we have to also, you know, show for it and have metrics for it. If it wasn't like that, I'm pretty sure my founder would shut the whole thing down and say, everybody come in, we're going to work from one place. Yeah, it's totally true. Um, another question is from Eric um, yeah, here. How can I personally earn six figures in just 12 months freelancing online? How can I charge more I than all really my know. competitors on Upwork? I think, I mean, I understand what he means there. I think it's because you know, we talk about Upwork and the freelancing and everything. It's, we see a little bit yeah. like this big revenues. So how can you like upgrade your skills basically to be able to make, earn more money instead of going away and with Upwork and everything? I, I'm going to have to disappoint uh, whoever asked this question because I don't talk about stuff like that. And I just don't care for it. And I don't mean that's a bad question. 
I don't care for questions like that because that's not how I think about work. And the measure of my success has always come from uh, doing what I like to do and, and finding ways to get paid for it. But I would recommend that that person who asked that question uh, ask Peter Levels. Mm. <laughs> Find Peter Levels. He'll, he'll tell you, he'll, he'll talk your ear off. He'll talk to you for days about how to make high volume, low margin, low volume, whatever the hell business is that he talks about. So yeah. Mm. Go, go I, mean, I, think that, I think that the main, um, I mean, the question is kind of like, you know, uh, very like 60 years and everything, but I think what the question is or what the um, struggle is, is how to make people to charge more basically in comparison with Upwork, you know, or as a content writer or you, when you, you have people and you use Upwork to find work, it's hard to be able to compete because there's so many people who are charging so mm -hmm. less for different countries. So, mm -hmm. um, I think this is but then I see like, I, I just, I just, I'm not disagreeing with you. I disagree with that concept because yeah. um, it, it comes down to what work you decide to pick up. And if you constantly go for the tidbit projects that only pay so cheap and are very highly competitive in that nature, because there's so many people that do that work, then why are you playing in that space? Hmm. Build your own space, build what you are effective at, and then start, you know, charging the big dollars that you want. Um, you know, I don't play in those, in those small freelance $10, $100 jobs, you know, I look for the long term big assignments that are going to pay my bills, pay my rent and allow me to live the life that I want to live. If this person is asking how to make that in 12 months and be six figures, I don't know. I don't, there's no answer oh, yeah, to it. 12 months thing. You know, read, read some books. I don't know. That's what I say. Read some books. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure. Like Warren Buffett, Warren Buffett wrote something on it, so probably. Yeah, it's not something that happened <laughs> uh, like from the day to the other. But um, so another question from Spencer: uh, If you are a UX designer, and normally would have a lot of client in-person interaction, like contact. He says, how can you adapt to a remote work situation when you have clients that want to see you uh, in person? That's a good question. Um, I would probably try and be as visible as possible to them. Um, no matter, I, I've always thought that even if you're remote work or you're in an office, there's no problem with redundant communication to be as clear as possible, as concise as possible, um, to make sure that you're very, very, very like, there's so much clarity in what you're saying and what you're doing and then that they can see you, whether you're in an office environment or at home, that's always going to be the case. You're going to have conference calls. You're going to have Skype meetings. I mean, even when I was working in an office, I wasn't really seeing my clients in person that much because we were trying to save money. So we just do Skype calls and conference calls. And uh, so for me, it's like, you know, be visible, uh, deliver, and be very clear on when you're going to deliver stuff, if it's not coming when it was supposed to, um, and what you're going to do about it because you, you're, you're delayed or, you know, it's going to have to be pushed out a bit. The, the sooner you communicate that element, you know, the more at ease your clients are going to be. They just want to be at ease. They actually don't care if they can't see you or shake your hand. They just want to know if you can get the job done. And the reason why they ask for more visibility is because they just don't trust you enough. So mm -hmm. make them trust you. Totally. And I'd like to tell Spencer as well that we had a session with Lila from Hanu, who is a UX designer, and it's a UX design uh, agency. So uh, they probably have that, that kind of experience. So you'll be able to ask again, uh, Lila there. Um, so I have a question from Brian here. Um, you mentioned task, manage task management and being a doer. What is your toolkit for project management, task management, and business management? Woo. Okay. Um, I use a, I use a combination of things. I wish I could like move my thing my, like this so you could see what's here and what's here. So I use a combination of on paper, on wall, but then I also use some apps. Mm. Um, all of that manages my day to day. I use uh, Google Keep to do my on the go to do list to be like, here's what I got to get done today. And if I have something in my head and I don't have a piece of paper around me, I type it into Google Keep. I'll then look at Google Keep and I'll migrate that into Trello. And then Trello is where I put all my different boards for the different projects that I'm working on, um, you know, to spec, to do, doing, done, blocked, whatever. And then at home I have a wall here and I have a huge wall over there, which is just covered in post-it notes for when I'm doing um, kind of collaborative task management with people if I'm in my home office. Even when I'm away, if I'm traveling and stuff, I'll always have like pen and paper so we can scratch stuff out and draw it out. As far as task management, all that kind of covers me. I think Trello has been a, a godsend for me and I would recommend maybe for another human made event, if you could get the Trello CEO mm. to talk to you from 
because you know he's done a lot of stuff um, in that remote workspace building a company. Business management, I have an accountant because I don't. <laughs> I'm a writer. I don't deal with numbers, so uh, I've got an accountant in Canada and an accountant here in Australia that helps me deal with that stuff, and they're fantastic. And I don't mind spending the extra money if it mm. means that they save money. <laughs> And that's, that's, you're very lucky. I think I need to find a good accountant as well. <laughs> um, that's awesome. Um, another question. So we have four more minutes for more questions. Um, I have a question from Ines. Uh, how do you manage your finance since you can hire, you can hire any part of the world. You can be hired in any part of the world, so different rules, different habits, different currency. So how do you manage yeah. all this money coming from your contracts and everything? Yeah. So, um, the laws, the laws here is still fuzzy because there's nothing that works on a global level. There might be one day soon. The country that you are from, uh, where your citizenship is, is where you pay your taxes. It's where you owe your obligations for any money that is earned. I live in Australia now, full time, uh, even though I travel as a nomad. This is my base. So any money I earn is paid out to Australia. Now, that being said, I encourage every single one of you, and uh, I do this, if I, so Monica, I have dual citizenship, I'm Canadian and Australian, but because I no longer reside or live in Canada full time, and I don't earn any income from sources there, uh, I don't, I file my tax, tax obligations with just that in mind in Canada. I still file, but I don't show because I don't have anything there. Whereas mm -hmm. here um, in Australia, which I just did last week, I had to show all that. Now, so my second point was everyone should do this no matter what you do, put any money you make, take a percentage of that check and put it into a bank account and put it there for safekeeping. I have had instances where because the laws are so ambiguous that I have gotten letters from the Canadian uh, tax kind of ministry um, saying that I owed them money and it was because it was just way too ambiguous. I always put money aside for the event that that will happen it's like a safety net because you don't know what's going to happen as far as um, the way that um, your country of citizenship looks at your tax obligations or your financial management. Mm -hmm. um, and then, like I said, get a good accountant because my accountant saved me a ton of money last year um, by going through that paperwork for me. I think I'm going to contact your accountant. <laughs> I hope you find an accountant that just understands, you know, the kind of lifestyle of working. Wait, you're from, you're from Montreal. He's in, he's in Toronto. So he's actually, I can recommend him to you. He's a good guy. We'll talk about it another time. <laughs> awesome. Uh, so we have two minutes for one more. Um, I'm going to ask you, um, how's gig economy going in the U.S.? Uh, I said, I suppose Kavig is U.S. based, but you said you are not. Um, everyone is talking about career portfolio. I suppose that we should experience several gigs and or positions in order to promote them accordingly. Um, yeah. Eventually in personal branding as a freelancers any thoughts about that yeah i think i think um gig economy is just a fancy word for the fact that like um jobs don't last as long as they used to um you know our parents probably worked at one place for 30 years we're going to be working in places for maybe two to five years max and have to go to a new place and that's okay um i think that if you can take advantage of the gig economy it's a fantastic thing because um, it allows you to, to pick and choose the work that you want to do if you're good at selling yourself for that work. And that's what a big component of my presentation is about. You need to be entrepreneurial. You need to have technology ability. You need to have language ability. You need to have remote work ability, organization, process, communication, all that stuff in order to navigate all the different types of work that's going to be flying around all the time. And there's going to be low paying, terrible, whatever work, and there's going to be great paying work. You want to work towards that spectrum of the great paying work and you have to start low and, and work your way up. But I think take advantage of the gig economy, be okay mm -hmm. with, you know, not having just one job for the next two or three years, not so much like always be looking for that next big pay jump, but look for the next cool thing you want to work on and how, you know, you can sell yourself to that company or to that individual or organization to say, yeah, let's hire this person. Mm -hmm. That's I think the advantage of the gig economy. And that's, that's what's happening. What you see in the news about like Uber and all that kind of stuff, you know, that's more, it, it, that's happening, but that's more on like the, the, the low skilled labor jobs. When we look at some of the um, well, higher, you, higher skills. We don't have any more time. Oh, okay. That's all. Gig economy is a good thing if you can make it work. Boom. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much, Kenny, for joining us and also from Australia. It's very late where you are right now. So thank you for, for joining us and uh, I hope we'll see you again soon. 
See you. Thank you very much. Have a good rest of the event, everyone. Thank you. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, change a session. I'm going to pull you all in and set up uh, Jeff Robbins. So see you in five minutes.